Good morning. Good morning. Um, for those of you who are watching on Facebook, who will be many more than we are here gathered today, uh, we do have communion today, so if you've got elements ready at home, you're welcome to join us for that. Um, since we've got a small number of people, we're just going to sing one verse of our opening hymn, Thy Holy Wings, number 741. Uh, okay. Hmm. Thy holy wings, O Savior, spread gently over me, and let me rest securely through good and ill in thee. O be my strength and portion, my rock and hiding place, and let my every moment be lived within thy grace. Our opening prayer is printed in the bulletins. I invite you to join me as we come to God. Let us pray. Holy God, our strength and our redeemer, by your spirit hold us forever, that through grace we may worship you and faithfully serve you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword, in the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and to gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and the Holy One of Israel, of him, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nations, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and rise up. Princes will see you and bow down. Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel has chosen you. Here ends our first reading. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, Paul writes this letter to the church of Corinth, you know, encouraging them in their faith, and, um, just as a reminder that, that each and every one is, is a servant of God and called to work together. So we read verses 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, 
together with all of those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all of your speaking, in all your knowledge, because of our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gifts as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Here ends a second reading. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our gospel for this day is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning at verse 29. I invite you to stand as you're comfortable standing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him, except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen, and I testify, that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent the day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of those two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. And we sing hymn number 713, Lord, let my heart be good so. In today's gospel, there's twice that we hear those words, the next day, on the next day. And this is, you know, the way John begins his gospel is so totally different than the other gospel writers. He doesn't really have a birth narrative of Jesus. He doesn't have the baptism of Jesus. But in today's gospel reading, he refers to the baptism of Jesus. And as I said, this, our reading started with the next day. So what happened the day before this is that the, the religious leaders in Jerusalem 
had sent some people to find out from John who he was. They had come, scribes and Pharisees, sent by the Fer sent scribes and others sent by the Pharisees to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah? Are you the prophet Elijah? Or why? Why are you baptizing? And John had told them that he was not the Messiah. He was not Elijah and he was not the prophet. Although I think he was a little bit wrong when he said he wasn't a prophet. And Jesus also does refer to him as, you know, he said Elijah came and you didn't recognize him. So many times people will say that Eli uh, John was uh, the figure of Elijah coming. But John says that Jesus is the one, he, he says the whole Lamb of God who's coming to take away the sin of the world. And he said, I recognize this Jesus because I was told, John had had a vision that it said to him, the one that the Spirit descends upon will be the one that I sent to baptize with the Holy Spirit. The one that this Holy Spirit descends upon. We just confessed our faith with the words that Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit and faith in also the Holy Spirit. I believe in, in that Holy Spirit that God sends to visit with and to talk to with and to lead and to guide us. And John trusted that Holy Spirit. He, see, he saw that this, this Holy Spirit had come and rested upon Jesus. And he, and he proclaims to all of those around, and, and these include these scribes and others that had come from, from Jerusalem to find out who John was. When he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then he says of Jesus that he is a man who came before him even though he was born later. We know that Elizabeth was six months pregnant with John before Mary found out that she was pregnant with Jesus because Mary went to visit her relative Elizabeth in the sixth month. So that even though John was older and John came with this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, he realized that Jesus was the eternity from, from before. That Jesus was the Messiah, the one promised, the, the descendant of David, who would be the Savior of the world. And he refers to him that way on this day, this first time it says, the next day, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then the next day again, as John is with his disciples, he sees Jesus and he says, look, the Son of God. He exclaims that. He doesn't just say it, you know, but he exclaims it. He is professing Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, as this promised Savior that's come. And as these disciples of John, who have been following John, and, and you know, one of them is named Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So John had people that were, were listening to him, that were his groupies, so to speak, you know, but... When John pointed them to Jesus, they listened to John as well. And later when John was in prison, we know that John sent some others to ask of Jesus, are you the Messiah or should we wait for another? So after John was arrested, you know, then he began to, began to wonder a little bit, is, is this really the one? But here two days in a row, Jesus is professed to be the Son of God by John. And as Andrew and this other unnamed disciple follow Jesus, it says Jesus turned and saw them and asked them, what do you want? Have you ever been caught observing someone? You know, you're paying attention to what's going on and then they, they, they find you out and you're kind of a little bit embarrassed or you don't know what to say. And, you know, so for those disciples to say, uh, where are you staying? Seems like. You know, a little bit of a strange request to me, where are you staying? <clears throat> but Jesus says to them, come and see. That simple invitation of come and see. Or as he said to others, follow me. It's a simple invitation <clears throat> that so often, <clears throat> excuse me, is all we need. And I was thinking about invitations. And I heard once many years ago that that a person needs to be invited to come to church seven times before they come. And as Lutherans, 
we're so confident that about once every seven years we might invite someone to come. So every 49 years we might have results, you know? And as I was thinking about that invitation, you know, this was what, you know, Jesus' invitation, come and see. I was thinking about that invitation and I remembered a classmate I had for just a couple of years in high school, Galen. Galen is his first name, he had a brother, Paul. And their father was the pastor of the Evangelical Free Church in McHenry. And Galen, I mean, we, we would ride bike, we would play together, we would do a lot of things together. <laughs> but every once in a while, on a Saturday, he would invite me to come to worship with him on the Sunday morning. And Galen knew very well that I went with my parents to our Saviors virtually every Sunday. We hardly ever missed. But yet Galen invited me to come to worship. I wonder if Galen invited any of our other classmates and friends to worship. I, I don't know. And I know that you know Galen lives in Fargo now. And I wonder, does he still continue the, to be that evangelist, to be the one that is inviting others to come? And I thought about how do we invite people to come? Well, one of the ways that we invite people to come is this little sign that sits outside here. You know, it says Mabel Luther Church, uh, worship 9 a.m. Sunday morning. It's right there so that anybody that drives by can see that, that we worship on a Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. I went to a seminar one time a few years ago that was uh, designed, or the hope was that it was going to teach us how to grow our congregations, increase the numbers of people that would come. And one of the ideas was that we would print up business cards for the congregation. And it would say that we meet at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. And that as a pastor, I would give each of you that are gathered here this morning five of those cards. So that during the week, you could give those to five people that you would encounter so that it would be an invitation for them to come to worship. And another pastor that lived in a small town said, how is that going to work in my town where everybody knows what time we worship and everybody knows everybody? And the answer is, oh, well, we've only worked with churches in Minneapolis, St. Paul. We don't know about this rural area stuff. But just to think about what kind of a, that, that just wouldn't really work for us, you know, to go about that, handing out a business card or making, you know, we've got a sign outside that says that. And, and everybody knows. I think everybody knows anyway. They're pretty, you know, pretty much assured of when it would be. But invitation, an invitation to come to worship. An invitation to get to know Jesus better. Or the invitation to get to know Jesus at all. Come and see. So Andrew and this other person accompany Jesus to where he's staying. And they visit the rest of the day. And it tells us in, in the New International Version, it said it was about the 10th hour. And that really doesn't compute right to me. Well, maybe if they started at six in the morning, because other versions say it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. So this is when they would go with Jesus. It would be sometime, you know, later in the day. And they spent time with Jesus and came to believe, at least Andrew came to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And he believed it so much that he wanted his brother to know. He wanted his brother to come. So he goes and he says to his brother, we have found the Messiah. We have found the Messiah. And Peter comes, or Simon as he was known then comes, to meet Jesus. The very next thing that happens in the Gospel of John, the next paragraph again starts with, on the next day. And then chapter 2, the very next paragraph starts, on the third day there was a wedding at Cana. Jesus' ministry gets off to a, a, a rolling start you know, just, I mean, it, it goes from the baptism to a miracle of turning water into wine in just, just a few short days. And the people who believe and follow in Jesus grow by monumental numbers in just those first few days compared to one or two. All of a sudden, it's 100 or 200 people that are coming and seeing Jesus and being changed by him. And crowds followed him so that he really didn't have peace of mind. But as he first begins his ministry, we don't have the, the calling of the disciples so much in, in Matthew, in John's gospel as we do in some of the others. 
But the invitation is there. Come and see. And I think that's such an important thing for us to be open with our faith. And I think that's one of the reasons that I, I so much appreciate the way our church is structured, this church that we're a part of, is that when we have a visitor come to worship, if they came on a day like today, or those that are tuned in, listening, wherever they might be on, the, on Facebook Live, they're welcome to join us for communion. We don't have any restrictions. When I was a senior in high school, our, confirm, our Sunday school class had a book, Our Neighbor's Faith, and we were welcomed to come to Galen's church, welcome to come and participate and, and be a part of their worship service. We went to another church and asked, our, our teacher went and asked if we could come to another church and, and worship and well, we couldn't come on a communion Sunday and we couldn't do this and we couldn't do that, but if we came and we were quiet and sat in the back, we could come. You know, come and see, where's the welcoming? And I, a, a friend that went to a church one day in a town where he had just moved and, and the pastor came and talked to him and, you know, wanted to know wh where his membership was. And if he wasn't a member of the right church, well, we could fix that. Come and see. Welcome. How, how, are, how, are, how, how welcome would you feel if you walked into a church like that and you had to make sure that you fit all the right requirements. A pastor friend of mine, when they went on vacation, they would go to worship at different congregations, different denominations. And one Sunday when they went, the pastor of this church came and said, well, we like to invite visitors of our congregation to, to be communion assistants. Would you like to do that? And he said, well, yeah, my family and I would love to do that. I'm a Lutheran pastor. Oh, sorry. You know, not quite so welcome to come and see. That isn't Jesus. That isn't God. God doesn't put requirements upon us for to come and see. And it's just, you know, I know that God shows no partiality. Didn't we just talk about that? Or I just talked about that a week ago. You know, that we realize that this God of ours, this Jesus, invites each and every one to come and see. He doesn't say you got to make sure that you've crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's before you can come for communion. He doesn't say you got to make sure that your sins are all forgiven and you haven't sinned before you can come for communion. And he doesn't say that you have to be perfect to come. He says, come and see. All you who are weary, all you who are lost, all of you sinners, come, come and receive the forgiveness. That simple invitation, come and see, can go a long way. You see somebody that, that has a need, and you ask them, you invite them in for a cup of coffee, you invite them in for whatever, come and see. You, you appreciate who they are, for who they are. You don't, you don't put any restrictions and requirements on it. And that's this God that we worship, this God that we, that we come to, that we ask for our forgiveness. He says, come and see and freely receive. Freely receive the gift of glory, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of acceptance, the gift of welcome. That's what God would have us be, a welcoming community. People that say to others, come, come and see. Amen. Our offering plate remains in the entry of the church, so we sing our offering response. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. Come, all who are loved by God, come to his table. 
We come to eat, to drink, and our hearts are glad. We remember the way that Jesus showed us his love. On the evening before he died, he had supper with his friends. And during that evening meal, he took the loaf of bread, gave thanks for it, broke it, and passed it around with these words. This is my body broken for you. Eat this and remember me. And after the meal, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks for it, passed it around with these words. This is my blood shed for you. Drink this and remember me. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. This is the body of blood of Christ shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Your sins are entirely and completely forgiven. Go in peace, knowing that this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ will strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Do we have any additional prayer requests this morning to our regular listing? We're going to pray for all of our members who are traveling and otherwise occupied today. <laughs> then we're going to pray for the congregation of our saviors in McHenry too. I didn't tell them I was going to do that, but they're uh, figuring out what to do. And uh, they need our, our thoughts and our prayers. Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks that you invite us to come to you freely, that it doesn't matter who we are or how many sins we've committed, that your love for us is unending. You ask us to repent, you ask us to try to do better, and we do, but we fail so often. So thank you for your love and your grace and your invitation to be your people. Help us to show that love and to invite others to, to know your love and your grace as well. Help us to continue to be open and inviting and welcoming. We pray for our nation, Lord, um, and, and we give thanks for the freedoms that we have. Protect and preserve our borders and, and our peoples, our freedoms, our, our rights that are given to us in the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Help our leaders to rule fairly we give you thanks for all who serve so faithfully for all of the people. We give you thanks for the laws that keep us safe on the road and in our workplaces and in our homes <coughs> that protect us from the evils and the dangers of the world. And we give you thanks for those that serve to protect those laws. We give you thanks as well for doctors and nurses and the miracles of modern medicine and ask that you would lead their hands as they give care and treatments to those who those whose lives are not on an even keel right now those whose bodies are racked with cancers or different diseases that that leave them less than able to carry out their 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 work that threaten their lives so we pray today as we often do for sue backer for nolan hoffman Shirley Grinauger, for Dean Hoverson, for Terry Hoyt, for Nancy Dahl. And we pray for our members who are traveling, those who are in Arizona, and those who are just different places in our state. We appreciate the freedoms that we have, the way we can live, and, and how we can spend our time. And we give you thanks that we are even though we are a small congregation, we're connected. We thank you for those connections. We pray this day as well for people who mourn, that they will know that, that you welcome their loved ones into your eternal arms. Give them your peace and give them your comfort. Give them your grace. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On this day and always, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 723. The Spirit sends us forth to serve. Let's sing the first verse and the fourth verse of that song. Mm. The Spirit sends us forth to serve. We go in Jesus' name to bring glad tidings to the poor, God's favor to proclaim. Then let us go to serve in peace, the gospel to proclaim. God's Spirit has empowered us. We go in Jesus' name. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.